Okay, welcome back to the Mental Toughness Podcast. Dot org. Thanks for joining us on the show. And I want to remind everyone, if you haven't done this already, go to mentaltoughnesspodcast.org and get your free ebook. This is the coaching book for 177 Mental Toughness Secrets of the World Class, million copy bestseller I've had it for about 20 years. Uh, if you don't have that book, you'll need that book. I probably should have said that before, but um, you don't need it exactly to do the to use the coaching book, but it really helps because it's the companion book that I wrote for Johnson and Johnson when I was a consultant for many years at Johnson and Johnson uh, in mental toughness training for their sales teams, and they trained all the salespeople with it at Jan- Johnson and Johnson kind of nationwide, and so you can get it for free. It's a it's a huge book, and uh, and you get it for free just by going to mentaltoughnesspodcast.org and putting your name and email address, and that will if you're a mental toughness coach, even if you're not, if you're a performer, read it for yourself. If you're a coach, co- use that book to coach other people. Again, Johnson Johnson is still to this day uses that book to coach all their salespeople, and they can afford anything they want. It's really it's it's kind of the gold standard of mental toughness coaching curriculums um, in the country. So good stuff all around. So you can get that for free. So today I want to talk about something that people don't like to talk about in really any context or any setting. And I understand why, but it's very, very important to be able to handle this, to to be able to do this and do it effectively. And that's handling confrontation. And it can be in the context of your personal life. It can be in the context of your professional life. It can be in the context of being an athlete. You know, sometimes there's confrontations in basketball and football and tennis even. You know, a great gentleman's sport. I mean, tennis probably is, along with golf, although I think tennis is even at a higher level because tennis players are physically, you know, (laughs) unbelievably, you know, they're unbelievable athletes physically. Golfers don't have to have the stamina, stamina or the strength, you know, that that uh, tennis players have to have while they're performing. Their ball stays still. Ours moves. <laughs> Big difference. So, uh, but golfers are very, it's very much a gentleman's sport as well. But even in those sports, even in golf, even in tennis, in the gentleman sports, uh, where people are usually pretty civil, you got to be able to handle confrontation because it comes up. And let me say it this way. You have to be able to handle confrontation and then maintain your composure so you can continue to perform. That's the key. I don't mean just handling it and walking away and freaking you out. I mean, guys like John McEnroe in tennis used to shake. Jimmy Connors used to do it. Eli Nastasi did it back in the 70s when I started playing tennis. Um, and there were other people as well. They, they, Nick Karagos now does. He's young, you know, young player from Australia. He, they shake people up on the court. They can't handle it emotionally, and it throws them off for three or four games, and it's one of their tactics. It's a low-life tactic. It's a, it's, a, it's a scummy tactic that those people used and still use, and it happens in every sport, but it is used. It happens in business. You know, people try to be very intimidated. People are bullies. Can be bull- I remember um, uh, I had a client that worked for Chainsaw Al Dunlap. I don't know if you guys remember Chainsaw Al. But he ran one of the biggest companies in the country. He was very, very famous. He's dead now. But, uh, you know, he ran a huge corporation. They called him Chainsaw. Why? Because he'd cut people up. I mean, not literally, but figuratively. He was, he was brutal. And one of my clients was one of his top people, top executives. Not one of the nicest guys. I won't name his name. I don't have his permission. But he would tell me stories about Chainsaw Dunlop and the confrontations that would ensue at the company with the executive team. And they were the stories are unbelievable. The guy was a complete bully. He was a complete jerk. But since you you worked there, you had to as, as a senior executive, you had to deal with it. There are people like that in business. I mean, not all people are like that. Luckily, my God, it'd be you know be a zoo. But there are people like that. You know, you got people in politics like it now. They're bullies. Trump. There you go. You know, like him, hate him, whatever. He obviously he's a bully. He's always been a bully. So, and he's using a bully, you know, a bully platform when he was president. And so, and to to to, to do what they do. Well, you got to be able to confront a bully. You know, um, I never really had to when I when, when Trump was a client. It's funny enough, I never really had to have a confrontation with him. I would have. I didn't want to because I didn't want to lose the account because we we made pretty good money when working for him. Uh, we were just glad he paid because he didn't pay a lot of vendors. Matter of fact, <laughs> I can't remember any vendor he paid that I ever got around. They always said he never pays. The company never Trump organization never pays anybody. Yeah, I used to hear that all the time. But 
But they did pay us. We did get our money, I think, because Trump wasn't involved in that part. But I always figured at some point I'd get in a confrontation with Trump, but I never did. Luckily, I stayed away from him. I was told to stay away from him as much as possible um, because of uh, because he's a bully. And so I did, except for fundraisers and times he asked us to come to Mar-a-Lago and those kinds of things and whatever, But or you know, different events or whatever if we had to be there. But but I would have if I, if I, if I had to because it's part of it. Because the only thing a bully responds to is confrontation. That's all they know. You know, if you, if you try to be, weasel your way out of it, like Mike Pence did for years, and so many of these guys, Ted Cruz and all these guys, these sycophants, uh, le, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, Graham from South Carolina um, is another one. If they, you know, they hate this guy, but they pretend like they love him. Well, he doesn't respect them. I know, because I know Trump. He does not respect, and bullies never respect anyone that doesn't stand up and go, you know what, screw you, let's get it on. And not necessarily physically, but maybe sometimes. I mean, if you're a kid or something. But um, but even if you if you imply that psychologically to somebody, that's the only thing they respect. And it's terrible that you have to even think that way because it's obviously a very low level of thinking. You know, <laughs> you know, it's a caveman level thinking. But that's that's a caveman level of of consciousness as a bully. So you have to meet them where they are. You know, Tony Robbins used to talk about this years ago, you know, about this consciousness and then how you have to meet people at the level of their thinking. He was completely right about that. It's, it's, it's backed up by a, a ton of research and it's a, it's, a, it's a good thought. This is not the most fun thing, but here's my point of this. If you're an entrepreneur, if you're building a business, um, if you're an athlete, if you're any, you know, if you're listening to this podcast, you're, you're chasing something, you know, because again, like I always say, you know, I used to talk about this in, press, in the press all the time. It doesn't seem to come up anymore. I probably don't draw the question as much as I used to. People say, who cares about mental toughness? Why do people care about mental toughness? Why should they care? And I go, they don't care. Most people care less about mental toughness. They're not chasing anything. They're just trying to survive. And, that's, and I'm not putting them down for that. That's fine. You know, but people that say, I'm going to stake my claim. I'm going to be number one in the world in golf or... I'm going to build a million dollar business or, you know, I'm going to have this great, I'm going to be the greatest dad or mom or, you know, in the world or spouse or, you know, whatever it is, the dream, you know, that uh, drives people, whatever that might be, people, you know, have dreams, big dreams. And we just had a, we had a client at Bill Gove's speech workshop years ago, probably 15 years ago, I would say something like that named Matt Kinsey, Matt Kinsey, good guy. He's from Coral Springs, Florida. And uh, Matt came, and he, he, his dream, his brand new speaker, he was in Toastmasters, you know, the public speaking organization, great, great organization, 100 years old. He was a member of a little club. Then he joined the Bill Gove Toastmasters Club. And he told me, this is probably 15 years ago or more, he said, I want to be the president of Toastmasters International. The president. I said, you know, there's 300,000 members of Toastmasters, Matt. That's a big job. That's an international. I think they're like in 150 countries or something. It's the biggest public speaking organization in the history of the world. That's huge. It gobbles up. Or you know, I was a member of National Speaker Association for 25 years. We have at the top, I think, very top of the membership was maybe 5,000 of us worldwide. Toastmasters has, now has 350,000 people. They gobble up. It's a different kind of an organization, but it's amateur public speaking. But it's a great organization, and it's huge. It's a Goliath. And Matt says, I'm going to be president. That's my goal. I'm going to be president of the whole thing. I said, international president. He said, international president. He's barely a speaker. He, could, you know, he was just a brand new beginning speaker. Well, guess what? In two weeks, Don and I are going to Nashville to see him sworn in as the new international president of Toastmasters International. 350,000 members, Matt Kinsey. So good for Matt Kinsey. And my point of the, telling the story is that there are people like Matt Kinsey that say, I'm going, whatever, it's being president of Toastmasters International or building a big business or whatever it is. They are people that, these are the people that care about mental toughness because when everything else is equal, this is what makes the difference, how you think, how you process, how you think. And part of it is you start going in that direction and all of a sudden you start drawing fire. Proverbial fire, uh, figurative fire, meaning criticism, confrontation, 
People that don't want you to succeed. People that tell you you can't do it. People that want to get in your way. People that want to block you. People that want to screw you over in business. That want to say, I'll do this, and they don't do it. Or they promise you this, or you have a deal, um, and it's a handshake deal, maybe, or it's a contract, and they break the contract. They're in breach of contract, or they don't keep their word. This is the rough and tumble world we live in, especially as entrepreneurs. If you work for a huge company, they make no mistake. I mean, I, I've never worked for a huge company, but I've been a consultant to some of the biggest companies in the world, as most of you know, if you've been listening to this for a while, for many, many years, you know, 25 years, 23 years straight. And uh, you work for a big company, people usually don't play games with you. You won't get a lot of confrontation from outside because you're Johnson & Johnson or you're Microsoft or you're Tesla. You know, you're some huge company. People don't screw with monsters. You don't, you know, unless you're David, you don't go up to Goliath and go, "Man, you are big and ugly and dumb." That's just not smart. You know? I mean, David might might have gotten lucky once, but probably 9 out of 10 Goliath's going to win that one. <laughs> Luckily, there wasn't another one for David because I think he'd have probably had a loss. I think that if that story is actually true, if there's any truth in that story, and I'm not sure there is, but if there, it's a good story. But if he did win, uh, he got lucky. There's no question about that. And I think he probably realized it if it ever happened. But but point is, is that that's great if you're a big company. You don't get a lot of confidence. People don't push around Johnson & Johnson. You don't walk inside Johnson & Johnson's uh, national headquarters in, uh, in uh, Brunswick, New Jersey, and say, hey, you know, I think you guys suck. <laughs> you don't do that, you know. Uh, what did Jim Croce say? Uh, you, don't, you don't tug on Superman's cape. Not wise. Not going to end well. So they don't. But if you're a small-time entrepreneur, you know, small business, even a medium-sized business, oh, man, everyone wants to take a shot at you, especially as you ascend, especially as you get more successful. They want to take shots at They want to knock you down. It's kind of what they say in, in, in Australia. You know, we used to have an office in Sydney for years, and they took, talk about tall poppy syndrome. As soon as the poppy, one poppy gets above all the others, they cut them down. They don't, want, they don't want you to get ahead of them. So they'll take shots. So all of a sudden, you're in a confrontational situation. It happens. It's not fun. Nobody enjoys a fight. If you enjoy fighting, something's wrong with you. Nobody goes looking for a fight unless they're drunk or stupid or both. Nobody likes to fight. Everyone wants smooth waters. You know, whatever metaphor you want to use. You want to sail. You're not looking for a storm when you take your sailboat on, on, on the open water. You're looking for calm seas, man. You're looking for a nice breeze and a little sun and, uh, and calm. But that's not always the way it works, especially as an entrepreneur. You get in these confrontations, especially as you start to make waves. You start to grow. You start to push. You start to get noticed. And all of a sudden, people go, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? You're going to die. You're, who, you're, where are you? You're nobody from no one. You know, you're too young. You're too old. You're too short. You're too skinny. You're too fat. You're too this. You're too that. You know, you're a woman. You're a man. You're the, you know, you're, you're from another country. You're an immigrant. They, you know, they, they will come at you and it's just part and parcel of the process. It's what makes you tough in the end. The storm, you might call it. Again, another metaphor, but that's what makes you mentally tough. But the only way you can be tough is if you get into the confrontation. I always tell new entrepreneurs <clears throat> that, that, that do a lot of marketing, they'll say, well, I say, well, what are you doing to grow your business? And they'll say, well, I've been sending out a lot of emails. And I'll go, okay, great. So what else? Well, I'm going on social media and I'm posting about my business. And I say, okay, what else? Well... I've been sending text messages. I got a text message list. I've been doing that too. And I'll say, you know what you're doing here? This is called fighting the war from the air. You're dropping bombs from a plane. You know why? In this particular example, because it doesn't hurt. You don't even see what happens when the bomb lands. Okay. You got to get on the ground. You're going to have to get dirty and it's not going to be pretty. You're going to have to get in the game and confront the enemy face to face. You got to get in there. Now, if you don't want to do it, don't do it. But you can't be an entrepreneur unless you're willing to get dirty, unless you're willing to get confront, you know, confrontational at some level. Now, you're, again, you're not looking for a confrontation. Nobody wants a confrontation. No, you're not looking for a fight, but you will get it. Believe me, 35 years of building businesses, they come along on a regular basis, and it is, is what it is. And in the beginning, it's a little off-putting, but you fake it until you get tough enough to not feel it. Because after a while... Uh, when you 
are tough enough not to feel it, people tend to sense it. And they don't want to go there with you because they know it's a bad idea. Because they know you're too tough to, to break down. They're trying to shake you. You know, that type of thing. They're trying to shake you up. They're trying to get you off kilter and that kind of thing. And again, it's just part of the process. It's not, this is not the fun part of being an entrepreneur. You know, where you're standing at the top of the mountain, everyone's cheering your name and, uh, you know, dun, 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 and you're like Rocky, you know, with your arms up in the air and you're victorious. This is the dirty part. This is the part that really, where you really get mentally tough is when you're on the ground and people are taking shots at you, you know? And I, I remember when I, you know, my, one of my experiences was, I had just come off building a multi-million dollar company with partners in four years. We went from zero to 40 million. Four years. This is 30 years ago. Okay, so that one, 40 million was meant something. And we built it fast and we got rich pretty quickly. And I was very young. I was 30 years old. 30, well, when I left, 31. And I wanted to go in the speaking business. So I did. And I knew the first thing, the, the first thing that, that, that self-made millionaires do, the people that become successful, I interviewed all these self-made millionaires. I've been doing it for a while at that point. You either build a bridge to the top people who can mentor you or you bag the elephant. And the elephant is the person that can mentor. You either bag an elephant directly, a top person that can mentor you, or you build a bridge, people that know 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 the, the elephant. And you work, you, you build the bridge, and then you cross the bridge to the, to the elephant, the mentor, and then they mentor you. That's how you get successful fast. You can do it the, the way most everyone does. You can kick and scratch. It's really stupid. Go to people who know what to do, pay them, <laughs> do a deal with them and say, teach me how to do what you've done. I don't have 30 years to learn it. And if you get a great mentor, you'll do it fast. So I did that. I knew to do that. I didn't know anything about the speaking business. And I went and I got lucky because it's always, there's always some luck in success. People would say there's no luck in success are lying or they've never been successful. There's always a little luck. You always get a little luck if you make it. And so I found this gentleman, Bill Gove. The father of professional speaking. 85 years old. I was 32. And I, I set my goal once I met him. I said, I will be in business with him. And so, and the mentor that was helping me get to him, build a bridge to him, was a gentleman named John Spanath, a great guy out of Florida, just helped me so much. And he knew Bill and I didn't. And he introduced me. And, and I said to John, do I have the guts to, 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 to write a proposal to... The, per, the father of professional speaking was 85 years old and retired in Florida. Do I have the guts to, to, to go into business with him, to ask, ask him to go into business with me? And he said, you do. Do it. And so I put a proposal together, and we started a business. And I remember I went to a Florida speakers meeting, a uh, division of a chapter of NSA, National Speakers. And I had someone stand up in the group when Bill was not there with me when I first got into business with Bill Gove, who was a god in that group. Uh, you know, the, the first president of the National Speaker Association, the, the father of professional speaking. This was, you know, if he was a football player right now in today's day, he'd be Tom Brady. You know, they worshipped him. And here I am, this 32-year-old kid, brand new, never gave a paid speech in my life. I just want to do something. I just happened to be the one that bagged the elephant and got in business with Bill. And one guy stood up and said, I want to know who, in front of about 100 people at a meeting. I'm in the back, he's in the front. He says, I want to know who you think you are. Who you think you are going into business with Bill Gove, the father of professional speaking, an icon of icons. The guy who taught Zig Ziglar, the guy who taught, you know, Kevin Robert, Bob Proctor, the greatest in the world. Who do you think you are? <laughs> well, here's what he didn't know. I'd been building businesses for about 10 years, okay, sports, and I just built a business in the rough and tumble world of, of uh, industri industry, industrial machines, and that's not the easiest group to deal with, all right? Um, I, I, I've been threatened to be jumped in the parking lot about 15 times in the last year before that, and this guy's confronting me in front of a group. This was not going to end well for him, and it didn't, and I won't go through the whole thing because it doesn't matter, but the point of it was, was you know, I stood up, you know, and <laughs> I won't tell you what I said because, you know, it's a whole thing, but, but uh, it did not end well for him. And, uh, and it did end well for me because I went back to Bill and I said, these guys are you know, saying this stuff is crazy, right? He said, absolutely ignore those people. He goes, that guy that said that, you're going to pass that guy financially in two years. You, he won't be able to pay your taxes. And that's exactly what happened. And um, because, uh, because I was being mentored by a great 
but without the ability to push back, because I got a lot of confrontation. I had people come up to me and say, why did Bill Gove choose you over me? I would known Bill Gove for 20 years. He didn't choose me. I asked him to be in business. He turned me down. You know how many people he's turned down? Dozens and dozens before you ever came along. Who are you? You're some 32-year-old upstart. I used to hear that all the time, regularly, at National Speaker Association meetings, um, different you know, winter workshops. People would come up to me in the hall, and they were pissed. And I would have these confrontations. I'd be like, you got to be kidding. Do you, do you really want to go head to head with me? Because I'm not, you know, I don't come from your world here. So your speaker's world. So you want to do this? This is not going to end well for you. So get the hell out of my face. I mean, I, you know, I wasn't really playing around. And, and they learned to shut up because I wasn't going to take it. And that's, and so I didn't enjoy that. That's not my personality. I'm not a hard ass. There are people that are, um, you know, a mental toughness coach. They got the guys a hard ass. Not my style. You know, I, I like to be goofy. I like to laugh. Bill was the same way as me. That's why we got along. Bill Gove was why we got along so well. That's not my personality as well at any at any level. I am totally being people that work for me. They always think they're going to be. You know, I'm going to be a, a hard ass. And I'm and they, then they they go, oh, the guy's a teddy bear. Well, yeah, of course. But if I have to turn into one, I can in, in, in three seconds. And I think you should be able to do too. Just because to survive, especially as an entrepreneur, you're going to have to be tough enough to handle it. And again, I don't mean. You, you don't, and I'm not saying you have to win confrontations like verbal confrontations or anything like that. You just have to be able to keep your composure and keep going. It's a more, it's, it's more of a matter of mental, uh, emotional and mental control than it is anything else. But you can't let it throw you off. You can't let it throw you off your game. You got to keep going forward, and that's the key. So you can take all the criticism, Lord. Even if you want to fire back at him, fire back at him. I always have. I always. That's just my thing. But, but. It's not about that. It's about keeping your composure emotionally and going forward and letting it fuel you as opposed to shut you down. Because a lot of people can't take criticism like that. They fold. They fold and say, this is too tough. I'm in a jungle here, man. I got to go back to the zoo, wherever the, where the masses live, where the animals are in cages. Well, guess what? As entrepreneurs, you're in the jungle, baby. 24-7, they're coming for you. So you got to be tough enough to handle it. And handle and, and confrontation is a big part of it. It's not the most fun part of mental toughness, but it is important. Okay. All right. So with that, I'll wrap it up. I just want to encourage you guys, go to mentaltoughnesspodcast.org. Get that free ebook, Coaching the 177 Mental Toughness Secrets of the World Class. You'll love that book. It'll be a great resource for you, whether you're a coach or you're a performer. It'll really help. Thanks for listening. See you next time.